Climate change affects every aspect of life, damaging food systems, displacing millions, shaping the future of conflict. Climate change is a story of extremes, increasing temperatures, changing rainfall patterns, weather extremes becoming everyday weather. The majority of climate security risks today revolve around water distress. Climate change will continue to affect the availability of natural resources around the world. While some regions will likely see their water supply drop under probable CO2 emission scenarios, other parts will likely get more water over coming decades. But these changes will often manifest in extreme ways, such as prolonged dry seasons followed by erratic and intense precipitation. How do these changes affect marginalized communities and shape conflict dynamics? An extreme climate leads to extremely harsh living conditions. Across the Sahel, changing rainfall patterns have increased competition among farmers and herders over fertile soil, contributing to increased violence between the two groups, such as the deadly 2018 clashes in Nigeria. Across the Horn, more frequent and intense weather events, droughts and floods alike, cause massive displacement and instability, like the 2020 floods in South Sudan that displaced people and helped fuel violence in Equatoria. Across the world, governments and non-state actors like jihadis and gangs also use climate change strategically, from Al-Shabaab exploiting people's anger at the state's failure to bolster their ranks and influence in Somalia, to gangs in Mexico providing services in the aftermath of disasters in a bid to win support. Climate change is clearly a threat, but under the right circumstances, it can provide an opening for cooperation between conflict parties. We identify these risks and opportunities by blending field insight with climate science and state-of-the-art quantitative methods using satellite imagery, climate forecasting data, and spatial analysis. Visit crisisgroup.org slash climate to learn more. Good morning, everybody or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Rob Bletcher and I am the director of Crisis Group's Future of Conflict program. We appreciate your presence here today, all the more so at a very busy time of the year, an intense period for the conflicts and crisis situations that we all work on. For those of you who are not familiar with our work, Crisis Group is an independent organization working to prevent, mitigate, and resolve conflict through the on, through on the ground research, high quality analysis, and direct engagement with conflict actors and key international players, like many of you today on this call, in order to encourage informed and intelligent international action and local action and regional action. In this crisis talk event, as we call it, we will address the intersection between climate change and violent conflict and exchange on the ways in which climate change is transforming conflicts or fragile political settings. Our climate work is part of Crisis Group's Future of Conflict program, which examines new threats and risks of conflict, as well as new ways of addressing them. We are very pleased today that participants include policy practitioners, regional experts, and diplomats working on peace and security from the European Union and its member states, uh, and its member states, as well as colleagues from civil society and international organizations elsewhere. This crisis talk is part of an ongoing collaboration with the EU, and I wish to acknowledge the partnership with the European Commission through the instrument contributing to stability and peace and the collaboration with the European External Action Service. Thank you for your support. I am now handing over to my colleague, Hugh Pope, who will moderate your panels. Hello, everyone. I'm Hugh Pope, the Director of Communications and Outreach here at Crisis Group headquarters in Brussels. I'm a former reporter and Turkey Cyprus Project Director for Crisis Group, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, as you've seen from the invitation, you know that we'll have three sessions and we'll be going on for two hours to cover that. So get ready. 
The first is on how climate change relates to violent competition for dwindling resources. The second on how climate change drives longer term issues of displacement and migration. And the third will be on the strategic risk that climate change, <clears throat> change poses for states and for the opportunities being exploited by non-state actors. To discuss all this, we have six expert panelists. And uh, you should know that this this, this uh, session will also be on the record. It's being live streamed on YouTube. Um, Rob Letcher, who you just heard from, is the director of Crisis Group's Future of Conflict program, which covers not just climate change, but the global economy and digital technologies, especially social media. Rob is a long-serving veteran of Crisis Group, working particularly on Israel-Palestine and the Middle East and North Africa. He has a PhD on the history of the Middle East, which uh, is in some cases an object lesson on how climate change can really affect countries, and uh, especially historically thousands of years, it's completely changed the face of the region. And then we have uh, Alan Boswell, also from Crisis Group. He is our senior analyst for South Sudan since uh, 2018. Uh, prior to that, he was a journalist covering the many struggles of the world's newest country. He's also the host of one of Crisis Group's most listened to podcasts, The Horn. And thirdly, from Crisis Group, we have Ulrich Eberle. Uh, he's one of Crisis Group's first fellows for climate change and uh, conflict as we try to build up our expertise in quantitative analysis. He is an expert on what exactly is causing conflicts between, for instance, herders and farmers, especially in Nigeria, and the violence associated with the building of dams. And we have three guests from outside the organization. Um, there's Chris Hodder, is the UN Environmental Advisor on Somalia. And I believe his job represents the first time there's been a climate advisor to a peacekeeping mission. And he's a specialist in public health originally and climate change and disaster management since then, working all over the world from West Africa to Nepal, Chad, DR Congo, and Haiti. We also have with us Kaylee Ober, who is with Refugees International, where she focuses on the people who have been forced to flee their homes due to climate change. Her job there is as Senior Advocate and Prime Program Director at the Climate Displacement Program. She's an expert on state policymaking and the enormous and very expensive task of adaptation to climate change. And finally, we have Mariko Peters, who is with the European External Action Service here in Brussels. She's now a senior peace and conflict advisor in the department dealing with conflict prevention and mediation support. Before joining the European Union, she's been active in the law, in green politics, and has worked in Afghanistan, the Balkans, and the Horn of Africa. So thank you all very much for being with us. As I said, we're, we're on the record, and we're going to start with our first uh, section, which is called Resources Competition and Livelihood Insecurity. And to kick off the discussion, um, we're going to start with Ulrich Eberle from Crisis Group and Chris Hodder from the UN Mission for Somalia. And I'm going to ask both of you the same question, um, which comes to those who, like me, are from outside the world of climate change. Um, is it all about droughts? Are they the main problem? And is it drought, per se, that is driving competition over land resources in the Sahel and in the Horn? Or are there other climate stresses that we should all be thinking about? And uh, perhaps I can give the floor first to Ulrich, who can tell us uh, how things look from his perspective. Sure, thanks, you. Yeah, droughts are certainly important. Um, it is, however, important to acknowledge that the link between climate change and conflict is nonlinear. What we really witnessed in uh, recent years across the Sahel and the Horn is that extreme weather situation and uh, droughts and floods alike uh, put a big distress on people's uh, livelihood and in some circumstances can lead to conflict. And I think uh, trusting the most reliable uh, weather forecasts and also trusting the last uh, IPCC report, we see that the role of weather extremes becomes increasingly important. And that can be expressed in droughts, extreme heat waves, um, floods and storms alike. Great, and Chris, uh, can you tell us a little bit from your perspective, an initial reaction to that? Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, I won't have my video on just because I'm, I've got ba low bandwidth at the moment. So I hope you can hear me okay. We hear you loud and clear. Carry on. Great. So, so I agree with Ulrich, and I think we, we all agree that there's, sort of, there's no linear connection between conflict and climate change. However, um, we are seeing that there are sort of 
four rough pathways uh, to conflict, this link between climate and conflict. And as you said, drought is definitely one of them, but there are quite a few others as well. And some of the things we're trying to explore at the moment as well. So the first, um, the first pathway is really this sort of livelihood aspect. And that's what you know, we're, we're talking about. And this is where the sort of drought aspect comes inside. Um, and we have, you know, in Somalia, for example, we're definitely seeing drought as one of the driving causes or one of the underlying causes because there's a competition over water. Um, but we're also seeing displacement, climate displacement due to flooding. We're also seeing displacement and competition over grazing lands. We're also seeing competition of, and fighting over, uh, you know, fishing rights on the ocean sides. So, so actually there's a multifaceted part of what causes or drives this link between climate and conflict. But as Ulrich said, it's not a, a linear aspect, it's multifaceted. Over. Thanks, Chris. Ulrich, would you like to go down to some more detail about what you found in your research in, into Nigeria, for instance? Yes, of course. Just one second, I would like to share my screen. All right, I hope you can see my screen well. Looking good. Very good. Great. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining today. I am um, Ulrich uh, Ibalim, uh, Crisis Group's climate expert, and uh, I'm very honored to open this session on uh, resource competition and livelihood insecurity. Today, I would like to talk, as Hugh just pointed out, um, about Nigeria's farmer herder conflicts. And I would like to present our uh, piece that we published on last Earth Day together uh, with a report on Nigeria's Livestock National Transformation Plan that I will mention uh, later on. To um, give you an idea of what farmer herder conflicts are about, it is really an issue that is um, visible across the Sahel and the Horn. These are conflicts that uh, are um, happening between farming and herding communities. And in many instances, there is an element of resource competition. Um, and as we can see here, uh, really there's a spatial concentration in these regions. And Nigeria is one of the countries that is uh, mostly affected over the last 10 years. And as climate change is progressing, these conflicts increase in intensity and in frequency. Uh, but in many respects in Nigeria, we have seen escalation of these conflict dynamics uh, over the past decade. To, before we talk about conflict dynamics, I'm, I'm going to uh, zoom further in and um, um, so slowly pro, uh, 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 switch from the quantitative analysis to our underground analysis. Um, but before doing so, I would uh, like to underline that this piece is really an effort that stands on, uh, on crisis groups' uh, uh, work on this topic that is ongoing since many years. We have wonderful work on Nigeria's farmer herder violence. I also have a research paper. And really our ambition here was to integrate science into uh, policy analysis to, uh, gap, um, to bridge the knowledge gap between science and policy. And when uh, looking at our first climate variable here, we have temperature as of 1950. Uh, and just in, in the span of 60 years, we see an average increase uh, of around one degree Celsius, which is outpacing the global average. Temperature is important. Temperature is important for heat waves and droughts alike. Um, it is, however, not the only expression or manifestation of climate change. One key aspect that our analysis shows is about uh, seasonal variability. That is sort of the spread between the driest part of the of the of the year uh, compared to the uh, most humid one. And in the Sahel, we have a clear relationship with our climate system. The uh, variability, the spread between very dry and very um, and, and the rain season is uh, rather large, as we can see, for example, here uh, in Nigeria's north. But it's not only variability within years and across years, also just within a couple hundred kilometers, we have um, quite some uh, variety in uh, rainfall patterns. For example, in Nigeria's north, um, we measure an average of 700 millimeter rainfall a year. In the south, it's about three times as high. So the climate gradient here is uh, extremely steep. And people have adjusted their lives um, to these conditions. So for example, herders are mobile and uh, migrate seasonally to make use of pastures uh, in the time when they are available. All right, so the heart of our analysis in this piece um, is based on a uh, quantitative assessment that studies the relationship between uh, land productivity and um, conflict dynamics. 
to specifically look at the role of land use, since farmers and herders both use land to um, generate the incomes uh, here in green and blue, uh, cropland used primarily by farmers, in yellow, uh, grassland, and then in uh, brown, land is, that is interchangeably used by farming and herding communities. And what our analysis really shows is that violence is most prevalent in those northern regions as well as spread actually across the country where we have this uh, uh, dual uh, use of land uh, between farming and herding. And what I think is really um, insightful here is that it's not just an issue that happens in one country, in one corner of the country, it is spread throughout the country. Also, I believe that this kind of analysis allows us to zoom in from you know satellite based measures down to uh, local context here we have data that is uh, measured at 250 meter resolutions which is immensely helpful for our analysis to guide our field work but it's also um, helpful for policymakers to understand which places are most exposed to climatic distress all right back to the conflict map um, when looking across uh, nigeria's uh, conflict events that are related to land uh, um, resources uh, there isn't really one single story about farmer herder violence there's several things going on so for example in the northeast of the country the lake chad region boko haram contributes to violence in the northwest it uh, looks very different in recent years we see an emergence of uh, issues over banditry we have a report on that as well and then in the Middle Belt region, here in the center of Nigeria, that is where you um, would find rather conventional, what I would call conventional issues over resource competition, issues over land. And you know, as demographic pressures increase um, and climatic uh, pressures in increase, and there is less resources for the same amount or growing amount of people, that can cause um, these clashes between the two groups. And I would like to focus on these uh, states that are very central. There was a peak in violence in farmer herder violence in 2018 in these um, in the in the Middle Belt region. And um, I would like to specifically focus on uh, the states uh, Benue State and Nazarawa. Benue State introduced in late 2017 a anti-grazing uh, uh, legislation that uh, aimed at curbing trespassing and and also aimed at uh, by that. Uh, curbing violence between farmers and herders. Introducing or shortly after the introduction of this policy, uh, herding communities uh, have been displaced and some of them went to Nazarava state. Upon arrival in Nazarava state, <clears throat> it didn't take long until uh, a Fulani pastoralist and a TIF farmer clashed. There was this uh, isolated, uncoordinated um, uh, a clash between uh, those two people that led to a sequence of violence, a sequence of coordinated attacks, acts of retaliation that played out over the coming month. And um, in these um, conflicts, over 260 people died and only the government, only the military could put an halt to violence, uh, stopping uh, and as further escalation, however, not resolving or not removing the root cause of these issues. Speaking about root causes, the Nigerian government introduced um, the National Livestock Transformation Plan. It is a 10-year plan that aims at modernizing the livestock sector. And uh, one integral part of that policy is to introduce um, so-called grazing reserves. The idea is to um, change traditional um, cattle keeping from um, seasonal migration to putting uh, herders into uh, ranging reserves where they stay stationary and take care of their cattle. As we can see here, some of them are, in, are um, implemented where we have seen just before some violence. And when zooming out, uh, taking a look across the country here in red, we see those pilot states that um, were part of this early introduction of these grazing reserves. As per publication in April of this piece, the take up rate was still uh, lacking behind and um, we underline that it is important to get um, uh, uh, more commitment and, and these uh, uh, reserves implemented in order to make this policy a success. Uh, please uh, check out the uh, report. There's uh, a wonderful analysis and a lot of detail and, and all the recommendations. One that I would like to point out is the one that relates to climate change. When doing any of land-related, resource-related policies, we urge um, 
governments and everyone else to take climate science into account. And I think that is very much in line with uh, where the climate security space is right now. Um, from the UNSC draft resolution that asked for an, an integration of science into field analysis to governments, it is just helping you to get a better idea, make sure that these policies are still working in 10, 20 uh, years down the road. All right, that's it from my side. Back to you, Hugh. Thank you so much, Ulrich. It's it's always great to see that uh, so well illustrated. And uh, just in case anybody's wondering where you, else you can see it, you can see in the chat, you will find the links to the original of that scrolly. Um, so, uh, Chris, that's the story from West Africa. Uh, can you compare and contrast a bit in Somalia? Are you seeing the same kinds of resource country? Uh, competition is there any adjustment being made uh, is uh, how, where does climate stress fit into the overall picture of uh, conflict there yeah absolutely um so thank you uh, and just to reiterate yes yeah, so i'm chris hodder i'm the sort of first climate security advisor to a peacekeeping mission so i'm a bit of a guinea pig trying to figure out um you know how to actually move a lot all of the sort of practice in uh, the theory into practice and what do you do about climate security so i can sort of give a bit of a an update but i think that you know the links that laura was saying around the competition over the the livelihoods and uh, uh, specifically on the, the sort of herder um herder communities i think we can definitely see that in somalia um you know 70 percent i think something 72 percent of the GDP is based on uh, livestock. And um, so the camel movement across the country and the trade routes that were there um, since you know, a long time, they're being disrupted by these sort of climatic changes. And so um, we're really seeing, as Ulrich is seeing, and, and I think it's, it's across the board, this sort of changes in um, access to livelihoods. And I, I spoke a bit earlier about these sort of four uh, sort of pathways between climate and conflict and, and sort of first pathway is this sort of livelihood one and um, you know an answer direct answer to the question yes droughts is one of them and we're about to face possibly you know 3.2 million people uh, in a very severe IPC3 level uh, food uh, secure uh, food insecure level um, by the end of this year or early next year so it could be a, a drought similar to 2017 and so that sort of that drought level driven by climate change, but also because of deforestation and the charcoal trade, which we, you know, the UN and the government have been quite successful in, in reducing. Um, there's still a big dependency on charcoal and desertification, which is then causing soil erosion, which is then causing also, you know, contributing to the drought. But further on the livelihoods one, there's also the flooding side. So last year alone, we saw 75% of new displacements in Somalia uh, due to flooding and droughts, and flooding was a major cause of that. Um, so the flooding along the riverine areas is causing massive displacement. So riverine areas where there are the breadbasket of, of countries are really seeing the impacts of raising uh, precipitation, uh, increases in uh, river levels, but um, but also seeing, you know, that's where a lot of the agricultural lands were. And Somalia used to be a net, net exporter in the 1990s of, of food, but now it's a net in, uh, importer of food. So really seeing the impact of climate change on uh, agricultural lands as well due to flooding. And then also grazing lands and, you know, something like a large part of, we, we don't know the, the correct details, but something like 70, 70 or 80 percent of um, uh, of the conflicts in Somalia have some aspect of um, grazing land or access to water uh, as part of some of the underlying parts of the, com of the conflict. So really trying to see that uh, as, a, as a key part of this. And the last one is that we often talk about climate security on the terrestrial side, but there is actually also uh, climate security on the ocean and the coastal areas. And so rising in ocean levels, um, changes in fishing patterns, that's all leading to actually uh, bringing communities into conflict with each other. So in Somalia, we're seeing uh, conflict between traditional fishermen and uh, legal fishing vessels as well. So that, those changing patterns lead that a lot. The second sort of pathway I wanted to talk about was, around, was a bit around migration and displacement. And so how, how actually a lot of these uh, the competitions are actually leading to populations being displaced. And so, as I said, we've got something like 3 million people displaced and smart 2.7 million people displaced with more happening every year. Um, and the frequency, as we can see, as, as I was saying before, of uh, drought and flooding 
we can see that actually getting more and more every year. And that displacement of population moving from one place to the other is actually causing uh, quite a lot of conflict between communities as well. And also specifically in a place where clan dynamics is so strong that, that moving of populations and, and intertwining is actually causing a lot of that disturbance. But the question is, is are we causing it, are we calling it migration or are we calling it urbanization? Because a lot of the cases, communities are, are going back, going to urban environments because they can't, they can't go back because uh, a lot of the land is completely degraded. And the, and the, the projections in Somalia are that we'll be, uh, by 2080, we'll be anywhere between a three and a four degree rise, uh, which means huge parts of Somalia will be uninhabited. So it will be, you know, the communities will can't go back. And actually that then creates this whole issue around uh, international migration and movement of population, which is which can be seen as a security risk, security risk globally as well. The, the sort of third one is, and the fourth one, these pathways around militant groups and elite capture uh, are really interesting ones that we're trying to look at in Somalia. And so the idea of um, how militant groups are not only ga uh, gaining from, uh, you know, climate change because uh, the reduction in livelihoods means that there is uh, easy pigments specifically amongst youth of um, of recruitment into uh, into militant groups, and so that that's a really interesting area that we're trying to look at. But we're also looking at how um, militant groups are benefiting in terms of resource uh, taxation. So the charcoal trade, the sugar trades, uh, the exports of charcoal, um, and so and we're, we're also think, seeing things like how militant groups are bombing water wells or using water points as a control mechanism. We've also seen. Militant groups breaking riverbanks um, to uh, gain uh, for you know to gain um, uh, taxation of communities that need protection money. So they're breaking the riverbanks to stop the irrigation canals to stop those communities getting water that they don't pay. So there's a really interesting dynamic there around uh, militant groups uh, and stuff. But and the last one is really this elite capture point. Um, and how elite groups uh, and this whole issue of corruption, and we can see on the, in Somalia, for example, the issues of uh, illegal fishing and also other parts of, of the uh, corruption systems um, that have uh, benefited certain people. And so trying to see how we can work with governments on the transparency aspect around that. So, so just briefly, what are we doing about it in, a, in the sort of UN in Somalia? We're doing a lot of work around uh, you know, trialing some works on environmental mediation. We're looking at a lot of work around can we build a rule of law in institutions around um, corruption, but also in terms of environmental protection. Um, can we look at conflict analysis and bring in the climate lens? So we really look at integrated analysis of conflict from a climate perspective. But we're also doing things like, you know, adaptation at the community level. Can we do, can we build nature-based solutions into the this. Can we divert some of the humanitarian funding every year? A billion dollars goes into Somalia each year on humanitarian aid. Can we take just a part of that to look at uh, ecosystem re redevelopment and restoration that could then in the long run re reduce some of that impact to the drought and some of that competition? So there's a whole load of stuff we're trying to do. Um, and the government itself is doing a great job of trying to bring those central parts into the planning. So. Um, Ulrich, it looks like we've uh, either lost you or you've uh, you've done. Maybe I can turn to Ulrich quickly. Just to, you, you, you've 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 given the, the uh, West African perspective. Chris has given it from Somalia. Uh, are these very extreme, or do you think there are many other places in the world that uh, similar stories could be told? Ulrich. Yeah, uh, so there is a lot of focus right now on, on, on Africa, the Sahel and the Horn, uh, specifically uh, for reasons, as Chris just pointed out, because a lot of the issues are, are very visible there. Um, climatic distress and, and climate security issues are not limited to Africa, though. Um, if you think about one issue that we observe in parts of the Sahel, prolonged dry seasons followed by erratic and extreme rainfall. That is also a pattern we observe causing distress in uh, the dry corridor, for example. Then, as you mentioned earlier, Hugh, uh, the Middle East suffers from a, a different climate stress factor. Um, however, uh, also introduces livelihood insecurity there, issues over water quantity and quality governed or, or, or paired with, mis, uh, with poor governance can cause issues and has to some uh, um, 
to some uh, respect also contributed to protests there. So it is really a global issue. Um, climate change is also an issue of the global north. Uh, most of the issues that we observe leading to violence today are really uh, spread across uh, the global south, though. Um, that is also, you know, Latin America, Central America, the Middle East, uh, Africa, of course, and Southeast Asia as well. Thanks, Ulrich. And uh, Chris, you've, you've told us you're the first uh, ever climate advisor to a, a peacekeeping mission. Uh, what lessons are you learning in Somalia that, you th that could be applicable to other areas of the globe that we haven't mentioned yet? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that like, like for example, these um, uh, part of it is mainstreaming and the importance of mainstreaming climate and environment into humanitarian development and peace approaches. And so I think there's a really strong case for having an integrated um, you know, nexus approach to to, to what we're trying to do. So in Somalia, for example, we've, we've really uh, brought climate security into the rule of law institutions, um, done trainings and support to politicians as well, as well as like, you know, mar maritime, uh, military and police um, strategies. So um, it's still early days, but what we're seeing is, for example, on the environmental mediation approach, we think that hopefully it's gonna lead to a much more um, stable uh, approach to stabilization. Yes. stable approach to stabilization. But the idea is, is that if we can bring, um, you know, really true integrated approach with an ecosystems thinking approach rather than just dr drilling wells and, you know, providing short-term solutions that we really try to bring that as a holistic approach. So I think um, the early signs are that that's quite an exciting finding. That's great, great news to hear. And thanks very much Ulrich and uh, Chris for that first part of our uh, panel today. Um, the second part is is now starting. We're going to talk uh, something about which about something that Chris and Ulrich have both raised: the question of displacement of people, and uh, perhaps when does displacement become migration? Uh, the World Bank is currently predicting that there will be 220 million total intern, internal migrants uh, in 30 years' time, uh, and already uh, apparently there are 10.3 million people that have been displaced internally in the last six months. This is a huge problem, and to discuss this, we're going to have two parts. The first, we're going to have Ulrich and Alan Boswell uh, talking about the specific uh, areas of interest, and then we are also very lucky to have with us Kaylee Ober, who will come in a bit later to talk about uh, the big picture of policy on displacement. So um, Ulrich, you're still with us, um, and, and Alan Boswell, our South Sudan expert from Crisis Group. Uh, cl climatic distress is, is obviously one source only of displacement. You've mentioned other uh, classical uh, insurgency type things that uh, are, are pushing people out of their homes. Um, but uh, can you put, a, put it all a bit in, uh, in perspective? Uh, which, how important is climate within all the different factors that are, are pushing people uh, away from their birthplaces and perhaps Ulrich if you could uh, if you could go first that would be great thank you sure thank you yeah um in we have a piece we're working on right now that I will present in a minute together with Alan that focuses on displacement um and how displacement contributed in South Sudan to violence as well uh in South Sudan many things are going on uh there are different drivers of insecurity and different drivers of displacement, uh, such as food insecurity, conflict, and more recently also uh, floods in a, in a more direct manner. In many respects, these different factors are intertwined and uh, aggravating each other. Um, and, you know, it is just another factor in an equation that, you know, uh, puts more pressure on local communities, forcing them away from their homes. Um, Alan, do you, would you like to add something? Uh, no, that's good. Um, if we want to go ahead to the South Sudan bit. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, tell us about the conflict dynamics that uh, you're seeing in South Sudan. Hmm. Ulrich, do you want to go with your presentation to start off? Yeah, sure. All right. Um, yeah, my intervention will be uh, very short. I hope you can see my slides. Um, uh, the Future of Conflict and the Horn team at Crisis Group uh, started working on uh, displacement in South Sudan, as I already mentioned. And it is really, I think, a wonderful uh, work and, and very excited about this um, uh, collaboration with Alan 
I would like to provide you the big picture on the flood impact uh, over the last years. Really, the last two years, um, especially here starting in January 2020, where the 2020 mark is, and uh, also right now, in fact, uh, the floods had uh, a big impact in, on uh, South Sudan, displacing over half a million people um, and contributing to uh, widespread insecurity and uh, also to violence in Equatoria in South Sudan's uh, south. Um, so the 2020 floods, uh, and also this year's floods, seem to be um, very big in magnitude, unprecedented in uh, recent history. And to give you an idea where these floods uh, are most prevalent here, the data unfortunately stops in the summer, so we don't have the current floods here. Uh, satellite measures are always a little bit delayed, uh, so apologies for that. But I think it still gives us an idea of, you know, the regions that are most affected. Um, in blue, you see the extent of floods. The darker the blue, the more the impact along the, the duration of floods. And, you know, um, looking at just the last two years, I think it's very much in line with uh, climate forecast that predict for the Horn, and we already see that, that there is an increase in water supply on average per year. That means there's more water, and uh, a lot of that is distributed in extreme ways. And, you know, it is likely that the floods we have seen in 2020 and 2021 um, become more normal in the future as climate change is progressing. And, you know, in terms of displacement, we have data here from REACH. Um, obviously, it's, it's difficult to, to collect that kind of data, but we try to merge satellite-based uh, measures with on-the-ground um, data points. So there's um, certainly a bunch of points missing, but I think we get the, the big picture right. There's several clusters that are close to these places where we had the floods. And as I already mentioned, these floods have displaced a large amount of people. Some of them were herders, and some of them uh, went to the south, uh, contributing to instability um, upon their arrival. And to kind of uh, finish my part uh, with a quote from one of our interviews, snakes and people were competing for higher ground. I think that is uh, speaks more than, than any, any map I could show you um, to describe the dire situation uh, that we have right now in South Sudan. All right, over to you, Alan. Cool, thanks everyone. Um, there we go, okay. Yeah, um, thanks, Ulrich. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I think it's worth at, at least uh, starting stressing, uh, as Ulrich has done, uh, uh, just how massive and catastrophic these floods in South Sudan have been for now two years running. Um, and really the compounding nature of these two floods back to back. Um, there was also, I mean, in some ways, it's the third year of consecutive flooding, but the last two have been a, a very... Um, significant. Um, and so, and so, and I think over now it's over 700,000 people, which is quite a high percentage of uh, South Sudan's population um, that's been affected by these floods. And you've had entire, uh, entire areas and communities who have essentially been uh, displaced. Um, so um, one thing uh, that we have done here is we have tried to uh, create a little microcosm uh, and, and track specific uh, herding families who have been displaced, uh, primarily in the Jonglai area, specifically in the Twitch area from last year's floods, and then and then track them into uh, the southern region of South Sudan, which is the Equatoria region. Um, and this is the area that still has a remaining insurgency in South Sudan after the peace deal uh, in 2018. Um, and it's and it's been interesting because we you know we have herders uh, who uh, who left who left because of the floods who um, who who uh, who say that's the reason they fled um, despite insecurity and other reasons they were specifically displaced by the floods and they end up uh, in Equatoria um, with hostile communities um, oftentimes and with rebel groups um, who view them as. Um, as, as, as basically a hostile force also, um, and then who end up in, in violent conflict. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty direct link in some ways between, uh, between a climactic event, uh, displacement uh, leading to, to armed violence, um, tracking all the way through. Um, the challenge, which, which, uh, which goes to the complexity of all this, is that you know, this conflict did not start with the arrival of these specific herders. They just ended up getting sucked into uh, these existing conflict dynamics um, and in some ways exacerbating the conflict dynamics uh, that already exist. I'll try not to go into the, the, the whole conflict dynamics. We've written about it in Crisis Group, but essentially you've had, um, going back more than half a, half a century, uh, you have uh, migrations from the 
um, from the ethnic Dinka, um, from uh, the, the greater Boer area in Zhonglai State into uh, this Equatoria region, um, which is a mix of pastoralists and, and, and farmers uh, themselves. Um, this is for a bunch of reasons, including flooding going way back, um, but it's also become highly politicized in South Sudan. Um, the current president in South Sudan is is a Dinka um, and the, the rebel forces in the Equatorial region are opposition forces fighting against the government. So the fact that it is uh, basically co-ethnics of the president who are coming in um, with their guns uh, as pastoralists um, without really asking permission often from the host communities, that of course, uh, in some ways has exacerbated um, the conflict uh, that already exists. Thanks, Alan. Uh, is there anything that you would, uh like to say about how far you think cl the climate really fits into your classical crisis group style uh, analysis of, of, of dynamics. How, how is that helping you see new new ways towards conflict resolution and the sources of conflict? You know, it, it's interesting because the, um, uh, like we said, we wrote about this conflict um, already uh, actually very recently. Um, and in many ways, the, the, the climactic aspect wasn't a major factor because there are these massive political factors. The rebellion in uh, the Equatoria region uh, really, I mean, it, it came, it, it started uh, coming about during, after the Civil War happened in, in 2013, but it, uh, the historical roots of that go back to the 1970s, the 1980s. Um, and as it always does in South Sudan, it just keeps going further and further back. Um, but then uh, in 2017, you had this rebellion happen. And then, and then in the middle of this, one of the grievances, which include a grievance over you know, how much power they have at the national state, the share of resources they get. Uh, there's a lot of demands for decentralization um, and federalism from these groups. But one of the demands has been complaints of herders into their, into their um, uh, into their land, uh, are usually well armed. It also happens that most of the army is has been uh, dominated um, by the the Dinka ethnic group, and um, at least at least now, after the army fell apart during the civil war, um, and uh, from our conversations with herders and with uh, host communities, um, it's often the army, in the absence of credible state institutions, is often the army who's asked to mediate between the the herders and the farmers, for instance. So you can see how that would. Uh, not feel like a very fair uh, situation for the for the host community often. So I think it's also an interesting case because often, you know, usually it's the pastoralists who are uh, who, who who don't have much power in a lot of the countries across the Sahel. And South Sudan's a case where that's actually sort of flipped on its head and it's created its own dynamics. And I think even the the notion of of um, uh, even the, the the notion of whether or not this is uh, you know, climate induced or whether or not it's opportunism is something that the host community, for instance, would, would find itself a political narrative. So I think as this, as the sort of consciousness uh, that, you know, climate is changing and that it's affecting displacement comes about, I think we'll see that whole narrative itself uh, become politicized as well. But I think the key question for us is there's a lot of uh, the talk, I think, in the climate security space there's now that deals a lot with local peace building, intercommunal sort of talks, which is what's interesting in this case is we have a national peace process uh, that has broken down at the national level. The, the There's a ceasefire that's been repeatedly broken. And this uh, influx has sort of overlapped with that and exacerbated those conflicts. But you haven't seen much introduction of the impact of the climate and how that's impacting the conflict dynamics on the ground into that sort of national peace process. So I think we're seeing, you know, a sort of bifurcation between sort of local peace building processes and then the national peace processes um, and finding a way to bring those two together, um, I think is, is gonna be one of the, and, and exactly how to do it um, is gonna be one of the core challenges moving ahead. Hmm. Thank you, Alan. That's a great insight into the local politics of South Sudan. And thanks Ulrich for giving us a taste of the data. Um, let's let's step back a bit and look at the big picture. We are very lucky to have uh, Kaylee Ober with us, uh, who's got a lot of experience in advising governments on, on on how to deal with displacement, how to define displacement. I'm also very interested to find out what the difference between uh, forced displacement, displacement and migration might be. Uh, and we're also joined for this section with, by Chris Hodder, who's also can give us a, a, a look from Somalia as well, perhaps. Um, but first to you, Kaylee, um, what's the best way do you think to, to, to frame this whole uh, idea of displacement and, uh, uh, and how to make 
people react to it in a way that's not going to be a reaction of fear of migrants and more a uh, fear of stoking up climate change, which may be the ultimately be the, the, the more important driver. Thanks for the question, Hugh. Um, so from my point of view, what I always say is climate change is rarely ever the sole driving force behind displacement or migration. And I think Ulrich, Chris, um, Alan just illustrated that very well, which is that um, the ways in which climate change really induces displacement is quite varied. Um, and there's actually larger, more systemic drivers that exist um, already before climate change may exacerbate existing uh, drivers, right? So I think classically you can see uh, displacement as and migration as parts of a broad spectrum of human mobility. Um, you know, traditionally we see displacement as something that is much more sudden. Uh, you have a lot less agency in the way in which you um, move. And uh, migration is a longer term process, usually over longer um, distances, um, sometimes voluntary, sometimes forced. And so I'll be using kind of these sorts of definitions as we move forward in this discussion, just, just as, a, as a background. Um, when we talk about displacement and climate change, um, there, there's some very interesting or relevant sources of information to look at like the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, which really illustrates that uh, displacement risk is a function of um, the type of hazard at hand, how sudden or intense is it, uh, vulner existing vulnerabilities, um, the ability to, to mobilize um, social resources or economic resources to move uh, and the capacity to overcome these shocks, right? So I think that um, by and large, climate change just filters through these different things um, in, in different ways. Likewise, I encourage people to look at the, the UK's government's foresight report, which really shows that migration decisions are quite complex and context specific, and that different drivers like the political or the economic or the social uh, are really often those driving factors behind migration decisions, and climate change just filters through these in different ways and exacerbates these underlying uh, drivers or vulnerabilities. Uh, and so I think that should be the starting place, right? We're, we're fundamentally talking about issues of governance. So the, the the systemic inequalities that may exist within different sorts of contexts uh, and the ability to overcome uh, these sorts of um, these sorts of inequalities in the face of changing climate impacts uh, when it comes to dealing with it, when it comes to the outcomes of migration or displacement in particular. Uh, so that's the starting place. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Uh, Chris, you're still on the line. I hope. That, is there anything that you have to add on the whole migration displacement uh, question and uh, policy making towards it? No, I mean I think Kaylee uh, did it very well, and I think it's, uh, it's very, um, you know, it's very interesting exactly what Kaylee was saying. I'm just going to share in the chat a, a report that uh, IOM and UNEP did on climate um, uh, migration or climate displacement and uh, the maladaptation techniques uh, of a lot of climate displaced. And actually, it shows the difference between you know climate displaced populations and uh, conflict displaced populations, and it's really interesting the findings that often um, climate uh, displaced populations uh, they're often displaced multiple times or they are impacted, and then it's a real sort of uh, downward trend. And actually, they leave often in the last moment with nothing. Whereas conflict displacement often you you leave with uh, you know often you can leave with your livelihoods. Uh, and you can often come back as well. But what we find is that climate displacement is often really, um, you know, your, your resilience is at a real low. And it's just really interesting how the findings of this uh, show that also climate displaced populations, their maladaptation techniques are often around, you know, they need charcoal for uh, use. So they have to cut down trees. So wherever you go, displace, you displace, you cut down trees. Often you then have to displace again because of the, the soil erosion, the flooding, and so so actually the cycle is a real um, thing that we have to look into and try to break. Kaylee, from the, from the government perspective that you've focused on so much, what kind of policy advice do you give to them to try and actually intervene in what seem to be very local events? Yeah, I think based on this discussion, as you can see, it's quite complex, right? So the, the interventions must be multifaceted. Um, in a recent report we put together um, through RI, through an expert task force on climate change and migration, to heed the call for um, the Biden administration's uh, report on climate change and migration, we can see that this issue is gaining traction or interest from different sorts of, of governments, including the Biden administration, right? And we wanted to ensure that 
uh, the Biden administration and others really look at this from this multifaceted point of view. And we found there's two big buckets of policy work to be done. One around prevention or allowing people to stay in place if they would like to do so, right? So that's through things like investments in disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation. That's through um, targeting those who need the most um, support when it comes to uh, development in general, not just through climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Um, we also find that a second bucket of work is, is hugely useful to think about, which is um, protection and pathways. So this is acknowledging the reality that even with our best efforts to intervene and, and prevent migration or displacement, there still will be people migrating, right? And to um, acknowledge that reality and put together policy solutions that are quite novel, including offering different forms of protection or pathways to the United States or other countries um, that facilitate kind of safer and more dignified movement, right? So I think we can see that what's needed is multi, multifaceted and complex, but it, it hinges on both preventing as much as possible and um, facilitating migration where it's necessary as much as possible to, to ensure, um, you know, human security uh, and uh, future, sustainable futures are met as much as possible. Alan Cayley's hinted at uh, how difficult it is in emergencies to, to plan, but she has nevertheless given several very neat ways of looking at it from a, a, a policy perspective. You've spent hours, days, perhaps even weeks agonizing over recommendations to governments for crisis group reports. What would work in, in, in a country like South Sudan in terms of real concrete policy making that can head off some of these migration displacement risks? Yeah, thanks, you. I mean, obviously, preventing and mitigation is something that, uh, you know, is going to receive a lot of focus, uh, for instance, on the floods in South Sudan to try to just prevent them uh, to begin with. But then I think it's something that, that will end up uh, going up on several levels. We'll see a lot of sort of efforts on trying to create awareness, I think, a lot of sensitization for communities in terms of uh, climate displacement, especially the host communities, and trying to sort of ease uh, those those uh, those negotiated access, um, so to speak. But I think the I think something else that's going to be really important is just uh, always re remembering how deeply political um, uh, these uh, dynamics can get, especially when they sort of fall into existing uh, conflict dynamics like we've seen. And then and then you know, and essentially not forgetting that uh, so we don't separate, like I said, sort of local peace building from the national peace processes and find a way to to make sure those those stay connected. Thanks, Alan. Chris, can I turn to you? You're the first climate advisor to uh, uh, this UN mission. Uh, how easy is it to get people to absorb the, the, the advice you're giving to them? I mean, is it completely new to them or are they saying, ah, at last I've been thinking this for years. Thank goodness you've come up from, with a, uh, an idea to deal with it. Uh, and it's a fascinating question. And it, and it really is, um, it depends on who you speak to. So there's certain parts of the mission that have been very receptive. Uh, I think overall it's been very receptive and even the government itself on the sort of policy advice that we're trying to do and you know exactly like Kaylee was setting out some of the recommendations that we did from that report um, there, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of buy-in um, on this but but I think specific, and it's, it's interesting I feel like in the sort of more development humanitarian sphere there's much more um, buy-in and interest and, and thinking and already starting to think about what do we do um, and I, I think with the international media on it, there's a lot going on. I think on the harder security side, it's it's been a bit harder. But again, it very much depends on whether you've got some forward thinking, you know, different uh, people within the, um, the mission, or whether they're a bit more sort of traditional thinking. And so, you know, for example, we we need to change, for example, the UN base across to a, a solar panel uh, system. Um, so trying to think about mini grids around the base and how do we how do we move that? But there's obviously then that harder security uh, side that thinking, well, hold on, we need to think about the security side. We need to think about water overhead. We need to think about, you know, that we that we need to keep the backup, the generators, and so that there's a whole system and also an economic system within that um, that we have to be realistic of. So it's really around, you know, it's like anything really. There are certain people that are supporters, and there are sort of people that are less supportive. But I think generally it's been relatively good. Excellent. Well, th thanks very much. This has been uh, a really interesting look at uh, how this all ties into it, it, itself. Well, so we'll move on to the third uh, climate change 
area that we're going to look at. And uh, for everyone who's listening, you will get a chance to ask questions at the end. We, we definitely want you to hear what all the, um, uh, the panelists have to say first. And uh, in terms of that, uh, we're going to, <clears throat> going to move to part three, which is looking at the strategic risk of, of climate change. And this fascinating idea that climate change is, uh, is often called an actorless threat. And uh, to discuss this, uh, we've got, uh, first of all, uh, Rob Bletcher from Crisis Group, uh, th who's running our Future of Conflict program, and uh, who will be joined by uh, Mariko Peters uh, from the European External Action Service. So, um, Rob, if I can turn to you first um, uh, and ask, uh, you know, we've just had COP26. Um, one thing that definitely was not on the agenda directly was the question of, uh, of conflict security, uh, climate security. Or the link to 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 conflict, um, where should it's the home of uh, of climate security be on the global political stage? Uh, are there any costs for emitting it from the, the agendas uh, of COP? And uh, perhaps, uh, what are your thoughts about where it should be on, in the in the global lineup? Yeah, thanks, you. Um, certainly, there are there are costs to admitting it, uh, omitting it, and um, I think you could probably split up that question two ways, right? Like. What are the effects on the climate agenda if you don't include security concerns? Um, and what are the effects on security if you don't look at climate concerns? Um, and I think no matter which way you no matter which way you push it, um, or no matter which way you interpret it, there's gonna be a there is there's gonna be a problem. Um, so like just looking at the first one first. If you if you have the, the in terms of the effects on the climate agenda, if you if you don't look at conflict and security, uh, COP is actually a great example, right? Yes, COP was not on the official agenda. There were some side events uh, that did tackle the issue of climate security, and you know those side events were were trying to highlight the importance of the issue to try to pull it next year or sometime in the future back back toward the center. Um, I, I think the big issue here is that if you if you don't take into account conflict, it is going to be very hard for any climate agenda to realize its goals, right? So if you look at what was happening at COP26, adaptation, climate adaptation uh, was um, one of the one of the headline issues. Obviously, the headline issue was emissions, but but adaptation was also right up there. Um, and when you when when you think that you know half of the most climate affected countries, climate change affected countries are also uh, affected by conflict. Um, it, you start to think, well, exactly how are we going to get these adaptation measures done on the ground on any kind of meaningful scale if we don't take account of the fact that people are fighting, there are people running around with guns, there are people have invested political and economic interests in continuing the status quo. Um, and if you can't deal with the conflict uh, as a um, as part of your adaptation considerations, then it's it's very difficult to imagine how you're going to be able to move forward. So we've we've already talked a lot about specific instances in this in in the last couple of sessions, but I guess one where we haven't that we haven't mentioned, I don't think, is is Colombia. Uh, crisis group uh, a couple of weeks ago came out with a report on deforestation in Colombia. Uh, right around the time of the of the COP declaration on forests and land, uh, which talked about ending deforestation by 2030. But if you think about Colombia, in Colombia, there's a whole lot of deforestation right now, and that is being done by armed groups that took over territory after the FARC's unilateral uh, ceasefire in 2014 and the peace deal in 2015, uh, armed groups that took over, sometimes working in collaboration with big corporations in kind of like a gray area, uh, deforesting, pushing back the frontier, using it for livestock and and coca and um, and and whether illicit, com you know, whether they're legal or illegal commodities is less interesting than sort of the illicit economy that this is operating within and the deforestation that's happening. Um, how are you going to stop deforestation within what a little over eight years, unless you take account of the fact that there's people with guns and very entrenched interests that are that are in these places? Um, you know, we've heard about the loss of pastoral land. Um, in earlier in what we talked about, you know, uh, Ulrich went on about uh, talking about what was happening in Nigeria, right? Like how are, and across the Sahel, how are you going to do adaptation unless you take account of the fact that there are, um, that there's herder farmer competition over what's happening with the land. 
Uh, so that's the first way to look at it. The second way to that you to turn your question in the beginning is, you know, what happens to um, a security agenda if you don't look at climate? Um, and here, I guess I would talk a little bit about uh, what's happening on su on the sub-state level, um, looking at, at non-state actors. Uh, Chris actually already mentioned a, a couple things uh, about about Somalia. Here, it's quite important, but but maybe even before looking at specific examples in specific countries, you can take a step back and say, well, if you look across the Horn, and not only the Horn, but you know certainly Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, maybe Car, uh, the the cyclical weather each year has a lot to do with how people fight, right? Dry season with muddy roads, advantage the government, which is engaging in conventional warfare, moving heavy weaponry. Uh, whereas during the rainy season, when the roads are more muddy, it's a lot harder to move uh, those big weapons. And so it advantages the non-state actors who are engaging in asymmetric warfare. So you, like, you can imagine that as these cyclical patterns change over time, um, if it gets drier, if it gets wetter, that's going to have a, a balance, that's going to change the balance of, of whether it's symmetric a warfare or asymmetric warfare that, that, is, um, that, that is advantaged or disadvantaged. And, and I, I don't want to say that one side is going to always be advantaged over the other, because as we heard up top, climate change is not a linear process. So at different times, different actors could be um, advantaged or disadvantaged, but it's, it's something to keep in mind as we think about how these um, processes are going to unfold. Um, a second factor is uh, maybe thinking about where populations live, right? We heard a lot about climate refugees. I, I won't go into it again, but, you know, sort of always the mixing and unmixing of populations is always a dangerous thing um, uh, and uh, potentially a dangerous thing. Uh, we heard about the South Sudan instance, um, but that is an instance where climate is, is playing into a, a civil war and, and insurgency. Um, in the South. Uh, third area to think about in terms of non-state actors are about winning hearts and minds. Uh, if you um, think about the kind of drought and misery that's caused, uh, the, the kind of uh, misery that's caused by droughts and floods, uh, it can be a propaganda windfall for non-state actors. Uh, so it's true of Al-Shabaab in Somalia, uh, it was very true of ISIS. ISIS was very effective at exploiting this in, in Iraq. Uh, in that video, in the video we showed you up top, uh, we there was, I'm not sure it was, it was labeled like when the when it when the camera or the the animation panned over to to Mexico, there were pictures of care packages, boxes that are being given out that that are that are dispense us or narco dispense us. They are care packages that are being given to victims of extreme climate events. And there was a picture on one of them of a cartel leader, right? These are, um, these are you know, whether you want to call them PR, hearts and minds, propaganda, you know, regardless of the value judgment you put on it, these are ways that, that non-state actors are reaching out to local populations. Uh, and not only um, is it, um, I guess, PR value, sometimes it's, all, it's also real, government services. Like, you know, in Somalia, it's true that Al-Shabaab has, has, you know, sometimes, um, you know, taken advantage of, of weather, geography, flooding to um, advance its own interests. It's also engaged in what could be called like rough governance projects of, of building up riverbanks or facilitating irrigation um, in order to help control uh, climate change. So it's, it's providing a service that the government's not able to provide. Uh, and then the final thing I would say here under, under, uh, under non-state actors in climate change and what happens if you don't take account of it is the, are the entry points that it opens up potentially for proxy war, right? So if you think about, for instance, the GERD in, in Ethiopia, um, over the last years, there's been a new guerrilla group that has appeared in the area that is attacking, uh, that is attacking uh, GERD, the dam, uh, the infrastructure. Um, a lot of people see Egypt's and Sudan's hand in that. Uh, there's not really proof of that, but a lot of people see Egypt's and Sudan's hand in it. And I think we can expect that as, in, as transboundary competition over water increases, we're going to see more and more opportunities for this kind of you know, infiltration or sponsorship of proxies from outside. So 
um, you know, in all those kinds of ways, I think, you know, climate change opens up doors here um, for a different kind of client of security dynamic. And if we don't take it into account, we're just, we're going to be missing one important aspect of the, of the climate equation and the security. Thanks so much, Rob. And how would you suggest that the, the, the powers that be deal with this? I mean, it's a very complex series of, uh, of dynamics. Uh, you, you've got, um, it's, it's all very new for people. Uh, is this something that needs to be a, a separate source of summary, the whole issue of climate security? Can it be uh, fed into all kinds of places? Should it be part of the UN? What, what, what way do you see that this new dynamic should be best uh, re- regulated and, and interacted with by, by those who, who would wish to? Well, it's um, it's easy to say mainstreaming and hard to do it. So um, I'll say mainstreaming and I'll, I'll offer, uh, you know, just a couple of thoughts on that. Um, so I, I, I think we should um, we, we should not diminish the efforts that have been made so far. At COP, there were significant side events and there have been lots of people in the climate security community urging the inclusion at COP27 and, and, what, and probably in Cairo uh, for, the, for the next meeting. Uh, it's going to be, I think, a challenge to get it on the agenda for the same reason it has been a challenge to get it on the Security Council agenda, um, because there are significant countries, uh, Russia, China, India, um, countries that prefer to see this um, as a development or environmental issue because they fear that if it, if you expand the definition of international security, it's going to touch on their sovereign prerogatives and uh, potentially uh, interfere with, uh, with development. So um, I think it's going to be a, a hard lift especially when, when there's so much attention to emissions and there needs to be cooperation on emissions. So to introduce contested questions of war and peace, when you can barely get even minimal agreement on, on emissions, it's, it's gonna be very difficult. Uh, and, and, and also, so there, there's the COP piece, also there's the UN Security Council piece, as many people probably know, there is a, a resolution before the council now to have a general global approach to, uh, to uh, at least re- in, in terms of reporting on climate security, uh, that the prospects do not look great right now. It's still possible that it that it moves through. Um, but even as that resolution for the moment um, isn't moving, it is true that that there is climate change as part of specific mandates and missions. And you know, it's uh, you know, Chris is a is a is a pioneer who's the person who's pushing it through with the Somalia mission, and hopefully there will be more crises in the future. But there are other missions and mandates that it's climate change is included in somehow. Um, And I think we need to, you know, keep pushing on those. Um, I guess if you, for real specifics, for people who are thinking about this for next year, um, COP27, uh, if it cannot get on the official agenda for the reasons that we said, uh, maybe there could be a high level side event, uh, a leader level side event. There was not a leader level side event this year. There could be a leader level side event that is chaired by the host that would be chaired by Egypt that would uh, bump up the status of it. Uh, that would be the first thing. Um, and that would call more attention to it. You know, we could try to push on the adaptation front to sort of try to get the delegates at COP itself to weave conflict through their conversations. Uh, if they just say conflict, but don't weave it into the adaptation and mitigation measures, that's not going to help either, right? So if you can broadcast it and then weave it through, that's the important thing. And at the Security Council, um, you know, people are still working on it. Good luck to Ireland getting it through. Uh, Niger is also working. Germany wrote the initial draft. There's lots of countries that are that are pushing hard on this. And if it and if you can't get the the holistic resolution through, there's still the possibility to work on a on a per issue level. Um, and so that's that's where the pressure will need to come until we can get a, a holistic resolution. Chris, if I could bring you in quickly, I mean, how much would that help you to get a, a leader level side event proclaiming support for this, 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 this mainstreaming effort? Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that the, the fact that the mandate in Unsom is so strong on the environmental side allows me to actually implement a lot of work and actually then for, um, you know, deliver a lot of the things specifically around climate risk management strategies, looking at, um, you know, specific climate uh, vulnerabilities as well. And that really uh, supports my work. So I think that a more strengthened one is key to allowing not only more positions like mine, but also helping them really implement some certain things through the peacekeeping lens. And as Robert was saying, it's really important to have that 
that uh, climate lens within the conflict analysis. Uh, but equally, I think it's really also important when we're doing mitigation and, and, and uh, adaptation to bring in that, that conflict lens as well. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Chris. And uh, we're also very lucky to have another government practitioner uh, with us, um, uh, Mariko Peters uh, of the European External Action Service, uh, who's actually dealing with these issues every day. Uh, Mariko, can you tell us how is the EU dealing with climate change as a strategic risk? And uh, it, does it, is, is there a difference between the theory and practice? And how does it all work? Over to you. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Hugh, and thank you very much, Crisis Group, for this opportunity, and thank you for the co-panelists. I'm learning a lot from your research and um, um, uh, field of observations. Before I uh, try to respond to your question, I need to make one um, remark. Uh, the doorbell may ring, my kids, and um, I need to throw the key out of the window, and then I'm back uh, in three seconds <laughs> behind my computer, if that happens. So uh, that being said, um, Indeed, I sit in a very different place from the other speakers. Um, the headquarters of a big uh, multi-government um, institution, the EU, and I advise policymakers and program and project designers. And I found it so interesting what before Kaylee said, that ultimately um, a lot of the challenges that we're now looking at are about governance, that it's a governance issue. Governance, um, I think you were talking about governance in places where climate change hits the hardest. We're also talking about governance, um, which is I think what Robert also um, alluded to, governance in the places where the climate change is caused and, and the governance inside the actors who can um, or believe they can do something about it. And I would belong to the latter category. How do you change that governance inside an actor like the EU if you want to live up to this challenge of um, climate related um, security issues? Um, you need a lot of governance transformation for it if um, 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 we need to, if we can, if, if we uh, want to live up to the challenge. But we also know at the same time that governance transformation takes a long time. I used to work for the World Bank for a while and they calculated that let's say in average circumstances, any governance transformation of some sorts for it to stick, it takes on average about 40 years, four zero years. Um, so that's a bit worrisome uh, and we need to find uh, the button to push for acceleration um, if we're taking this seriously. Um, but definitely within the EU, um, the urgency of having to deal with climate change as a security risk um, has been evident for some time. It's considered um, not, not only an opportunity that we need to be preparing for, it's considered a certain um, situation, a certain future trend that we need to be ready for. But how does that realization get translated into the agendas and actions? Well, it started also on our side with all the political statements after the UN Security Council put it climate and security on its agenda in 2007 already, I think was the first time, the EU put it in the heart of its global strategy for foreign and security policy a few years ago, 2016. And since then we've seen an avalanche of political declarations, statements of all kinds at the highest levels within the EU. We have the Green Deal, of course, of our current commission and its climate adaptation strategy. We have a massive budget regulation of about 90 billion euros, uh, which is our budget money for anything that has to do with adaptation and development cooperation. And it has earmarked 35%, which comes down to about 28 billion euros for climate adaptation. Um, and uh, we've just learned half of that has to be done in um, areas where there's conflict or fragility. And then we have numerous of council conclusions um, on climate and energy diplomacy, climate and defense, climate and water upcoming or just done. And our own um, high representative is calling climate change the largest threat to security in human history. So this has increased the EU's ambition and space for maneuver for external climate related action tremendously. So the challenge is now how to translate this unprecedented investment in policy declarations into our actions. And in all honesty, this has only recently begun. It requires no less than a new way of working to live up to the challenge. I can share four steps that we've taken so far and a few observations. First of all, we're investing 
in getting a better understanding on the convergence between climate change, environmental degradation and security. We have incorporated climate indicators in our early warning systems. We've adjusted our methodology for conflict analysis, which we do in a structured manner in all countries where there's conflict and where we have EU programming to take a better look at the link between climate and environment issues and the conflict dynamics. And we are pooling all our climate and security relevant data collection efforts from across the EU um, 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 and, and try to bring it together into one climate security relevant um, system. Secondly, what we're looking at is upscaling first actions in the field um, that seem to be giving proof of concept that if you really program design around sustainable peace building in a climate change affected situation, you can make a difference. And there are some first important experiences that we are learning from, not in the last place, also from what Chris was talking about in Somalia, but also some EU funded project or EU conducted activities in Nepal, in Sudan, South Sudan, Tanzania, and some Latin American countries. But to be honest, this is still small beer. And we need to um, learn not only how to upscale, but there the word is again, how to mainstream this in the, into our regular programs and policies and make this way of um, of, of trying to target both peace building and um, climate um, in a structural manner at the same time. Um, massive challenges there for how to do the mainstreaming. Um, first one is um, how do you cross the silos? Uh, we're learning and we're also being told by everybody who's a think tank on this topic. We need to bridge the silos. You have the peace community and the security people, you have the climate and environment people, and they're not used to talking together working together. Yes, we come together in seminars like these, but the regular programming people, the, the people who do the hard work in the delegations or the people who run the missions, um, they already were doing human rights, they were doing gender issues, um, they were doing security sector reform, and now all of a sudden to take this whole merabois on climate data and uh, climate dimensions and complex pathways on board, it's a different thing. So how do you cross those silos? And uh, a second challenge that we're doing is that we um, are quickly learning that we need to expand our networks. Typically, um, we and um, um, our delegations will be talking to governmental counterparts in the capitals, um, whereas we're learning from these early field experiences that I just mentioned huh, that perhaps the solution to really make a difference in climate change and security is more in local peace deals, uh, very, very local uh, community arrangements and natural resource management. And also, again, it's very localized, specific contexts. But there you are in an area where perhaps um, a governmental actor like us, um, thinking in large numbers, large programs, ha doesn't have the best access, doesn't have the best networks yet. Um, and also, sometimes the counterparts for the networks that we, that we would like to have are not there yet. We recently finished a um, pilot for a climate and conflict analysis, like trying to really integrate a climate look into our regular conflict analytical work. And there we had to just come to the very sobering conclusion that there was no government counterpart for even all the, if we, once we had thought up all our beautiful recommendations with how to do something about it, um, 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 who to start talking to and get to know them or um, 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 contribute to that they um, come into being. Thirdly, we need to, we have started and need to do more of it, um, invest in the skills of our staff. Um, we must learn how to make better use of all these um, 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 beautiful climate environment data that institutions like yourself, Crisis Group, are producing, but um, alongside you, um, an increasing number of others. Thanks also to new set, uh, technologies, satellite images, artificial intelligence, social data mining, some are even already using. And, um, um, Let's say your average diplomat <laughs> um, doesn't yet know how to read those data, let alone how to translate them and then repackage them in bits and pieces for policymakers and program designers and um, um, diplomats um, who have um, big agendas in their regular dialogues and need to squeeze in a few seconds on uh, the need to also look at climate change and environmental degradation. Um, and these, this translation still requires a lot of investment in our skills. Fourth and last, we need to start taking much more account 
next to how we're now talking about um, climate um, 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 change and security, we need to start to take much more account of the effects of the green transition, which is going to cause a whole set of new types of climate of, of, of security um, and dynamics and challenges of its own. The policies to address the climate crisis through emission reduction and energy transition can have its own massive geopolitical effects as it upends traditional economic and political relationships. So lastly, perhaps two observations. Um, a concrete step on our end um, that has hugely expanded our operational, let's say, um, um, space to do, some, to do things that we want to do is the recent adoption of a EU concept for an integrated approach on climate change and security. And later I'll put a link to the document in the chat. And it's basically our operational framework for how to integrate the climate and security dimension in all our relevant policies from humanitarian aid to the design of security missions to our um, development cooperation along the entire conflict cycle. And then secondly, we have a, um, a new concept or guidelines on uh, mediation, how to support um, dialogue and peace building through mediation, and that also centers on um, um, aspects of climate change and environmental degradation. And very lastly, I'd like to say that a key avenue in how we'd like to go forward is um, in partnerships. Um, this we cannot do alone, um, so we largely depend on um, how far we can get in our already existing partnerships with um, um, think tanks, um, 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 civil society, governmental organizations, African Union, OSCE, NATO, and so forth, but also very much importantly, um, data partnerships. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marika. That was really clear and a really great presentation. I just wondered, I didn't realize that the EU put quite so much money behind uh, climate uh, issues, like 90 billion euros, 28 billion for, for adaptation. Uh, the keys are going to go out of the window. Well, okay, that's uh, well, while we're waiting for it to Alta, come back. Alexander, yoohoo! Here, the sleutel, I'm in gesprek. And America will be back. Sorry, I forgot to mute. That's okay. We, we've got you. We're glad to have you back. The EU is such a, such a big actor. You've talked about partnerships, but are, are, do you find people imitating you? Is there some sort of normative process going on that as the EU pays more attention to things, you're seeing it reflected more around the world or is the EU alone or how, where does the EU fit in as a global actor on this? That's such a challenging question. And before you know it, uh, what happens to you in Brussels is that you're navel staring and uh, completely absorbed by your own institutional environment. Um, but um, now we very much need to do this partnership with others. I'm uh, looking with a bit of jealousy at the position that um, 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 Chris already has. Uh, wouldn't we also wish to have our own climate and environment um, advisors in all ICSDP missions? The first three are about to start, I have to admit, but wouldn't we also, uh, very much like to have it for our delegations. Huh? Why only in our security missions? It should also be for all the people who have to do the adaptation and development cooperation and humanitarian work. Um, this is an invitation for um, um, people who can do advocacy um, and to help that, to help make that happen. Uh, we're working closely with the OSCE, who have also um, actually following the UN Security Council agenda, also managed to put climate and environment and um, peace. Uh, building on its agenda. Um, so we work together with them in the, 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 let's say, the Eastern Europe and the South Caucasus and Central Asia bits of the world. And uh, with the African Union also, on the last visit of um, um, the commissioner uh, who deals with peace uh, to Brussels, climate change also figured as one of the key areas where they are eager to also, um, 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 going forward, increase the collaboration with the EU. So yeah, I, I, I wouldn't dare say we're leading. I do dare say that we have a momentum as an as a EU now, which is unprecedented because we're about to start spending that, that, that insane amount of money. Um, and we better find a way to do it in a climate sensitive, conflict sensitive way. And just one more question to you, Marika, while, while we have you. Um, it's, this is incredibly complex. Um, how do you deal with non-state actors uh, and uh, how do you get down to the nitty gritty of this sort of 
basically what is, as we've heard, local competition for resources, uh, displacement on a very local scale. And it, it, you know, it must seem a long way from Brussels. How, how, how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, I was a bit afraid of this question because indeed it's so complex. Um, but um, we've been experimenting um, a bit like how um, Chris Holder was explaining his work in Somalia with this pathways concept, which was developed, I think, by, uh, I know, by a Swedish uh, think tank and which uh, various actors have now tried to apply in the field. We equally tried to do it in um, Sudan and South Sudan. So I've listened with great interest into your own um, research outcomes uh, in South Sudan. So we've tried to apply this pathways that looks into these complex interlinkages between climate change and uh, livelihoods, migration, non-state non actors, um, 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 elite behavior in the South Sudanese context. And um, the, the first results are just as complex as the methodology is and all the data that fed the work. Um, and um, it's now very much up to our delegation to take it forward. But I can give you some examples for what comes out of such an analytical exercise. It's um, what comes out of it is a um, increased awareness that we need to have not nationwide solutions, but very localized solutions. You cannot apply um, a similar and uh, the same solution to this square 50 kilometers um, and, and, and the next uh, square of, of, of 50 kilometers almost. And um, at the same time, we, to, next to the localized approach, you need also a regional approach, a cross national approach, because um, what happens, um, and for instance, perhaps to uh, another country, uh, to the forests in the, the Central African Republic, might affect at the water levels in the Blue Nile that fill up um, that water reservoir um, 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 of, of the Gurut Dam. And um, um, I'm not sure if we have been looking at the right issue, all this focus on um, 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 the, the, the security issues um, around that dam, while at the same time, um, that river may very soon have much less water if you don't do something about the forest um, at another place of the continent. But at the same time, um, what we also need to do is um, here again, expand the networks um, start talking to those government actors who have some type of control of what happens to natural resource management, water management, and some of them are not even there. We need to do awareness raising. Um, how can we use our ongoing dialogues to also start discussing climate and environment and water? We need to find the link between um, um, what all this new analytical awareness can do to our regular programming. For instance, in South Sudan, we were used to do um, a lot in support of livestock and food, food security. Now, what does it mean if we have a better understanding of the very local conflicts here, there, here, there, or displacements, or, or, or whatever happened because of all these pathways and climate change and conflicts to our um, food security program? Um, and um, these types of questions we are trying to answer as we speak. Thank you very much, Mariko. Um, we've come to the end of our, our, of our first three sections, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, having some questions coming uh, in from uh, many listeners. Um, uh, there are a lot of people there. Uh, I can see that uh, several have been answered already by the panelists typing into the uh, chat box. Um, but there's one that uh, Ulrich has uh, offered to answer live, so I'm going to I'm going to go to that. But while while I read it out, um, everyone else who'd like to ask questions, please uh, please go ahead and, and write them in. Um, this question is from Han van Dijk, and he's worried that we're talking about the farmer herder conflicts in a very decontextualized way. Uh, that that there's so much more going on, deeper economic and political crises, root causes, marginalization. Uh, takeover of livestock ownership by urban owners, uh, the lack of land use planning, uh, and that, uh, that these are the issues that we need to deep into dig, uh, to deep, these are the issues we need to dig deeper into, uh, and that perhaps we're, we're overestimating the impact of climate. And uh, Ulrich, perhaps uh, I can ask you that question, and uh, uh, first at least. Sorry, still reading the question. If somebody else wants to jump in first. 
this is about the whether uh, Ulrich, it's about the decontextualization of, of uh, the herder farmer conflict and so many other problems that cause these conflicts. Are we exaggerating by looking at climate? It's for right. a hand yeah. back. Okay, I got it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so I think one big part of our work is to understand the relative importance of climatic distress on conflict dynamics. And absolutely, there is. Um, um, no reason to overstate the issue. There are usually uh, uh, multiple factors that we have heard um, uh, throughout this conversation today. Um, climate change is one that usually aggravates situations, but there are already political uh, and socioeconomic tensions that you know play important parts to to um, these conflict dynamics. So but there's no, you know, we should not overstate the role of climatic distress, but it also becomes visible that, you know, uh, the direct impacts that we observe in parts of the Sahel and the Horn matter as well. But obviously I think the balance matters that, you know, we, we uh, acknowledge it in, 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 in the appropriate manner. Uh, and that also helps with designing solutions to these issues. America, maybe you- Hugh, you if I could just add, if I could just add one, one, one thing to, to, uh, to Ulrich's answer. Um, I, I also thought that that question was quite important. Um, and it is true in general that when you know, certain issues become, I don't know, the, the issue du jour of, of the analytic community, that a lot of analytic attention gets focused on that. And that maybe that might highlight it in a way which um, can, feel, um, can feel excessive. Um, but I, I think it's important to emphasize here that um, that um, the, the, the fact that one has a contextual analysis doesn't mean that you can't be precise about it also, right? So what, what I mean by that is, yes, in all of these cases um, that we're talking about, there are many, many factors. Nigeria won many factors, Somalia, many factors. In fact, every one of these is going to have many factors. But I think what we're trying to do at Crisis Group is we're trying to be as precise as possible about the role, is, the, the role that climate is playing, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean ranking any of these risks, because I'm not even, I think it would be quite hard to sort of like figure out, you know, how each one in particular um, is more or less important. But you know, through the ever increasing uh, precision of the climate science, I think we're able to look more and more specifically at places to see what is happening and to be able to incorporate that precision into, um, into our analysis and into what I think many of you know is traditionally a different kind of analysis that Crisis Group has done, the more field-based interview qualitative as opposed to the quantitative. So um, fully agree on the contextual, but I also think we need to emphasize the precision. And uh, Marika, I also wanted to ask, interested to hear what you had to say about that since uh, you're putting out an enormous amount of money. Well, is, does that uh, simply uh, create interest in things that uh, shouldn't otherwise be there? How do you keep things in proportion? How do we keep things in proportion? But in the sense that we had a we have a question here: that Are you not exaggerating the herd of farmer violence uh, being being uh, being? Well, of course, we're not saying it's solely due to uh, climate change, but are you not exaggerating the the the, the climate factor? Uh, is it a what I'm trying to ask? I think is yeah. is this a European concern that is being? Uh, somehow, because everyone is very worried about the climate in Europe, they're, they're transferring that worry to Africa, whereas Africa, in fact, they have other concerns. Very interesting question. Um, it, in a way, it's so theoretical because, um, let's say, uh, the train has already departed. Um, we have already earmarked um, um, 35% of our development cooperation in not only Africa, but also Asia, Latin America, and um, the East um, of Europe for this purpose, because it is our firm belief that the future will be shaped not only by uh, a, the need to deal with the planet in a new way and um, our energy consumption, and energy production, um, but that it has a huge impact on climate. And then we're not talking about um, how to have exclusive climate adaptation projects. We're talking about how we can do climate adaptation as these countries will increasingly feel the impact of climate change in a conflict sensitive way if we do it in a 
conflict environment. And as we know, um, half of climate change has, is already hitting hardest in conflict affected countries where the people are the most vulnerable and um, where above all the actors may not be the largest emitters. So um, it's a mix of being um, um, trying to be responsible, but also trying to be realistic. It's simply where the data are teaching us um, and the consequences are the most dire and where um, um, the capacity to do something about it um, might not be in national hands. Thanks, Mariko. Um, we have a question that I think is best answered by Chris from an anonymous attendee uh, who's uh, talking about the discrepancy between an enormous amount of uh, analytical work on climate security, but there's a deficit of work on the programmatic side. And uh, how can these be integrated, the anonymous attendee asks. Um, is, and how can there be more people like Chris Hodder, is how he specifically says it. Um, Chris, would you like to try and self-multiply yourself or show the way? I'll try to, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I'd love to have more people like me. I think it's, uh, it's, it's really important to, obviously. Um, but uh, no, I mean, I, I think that uh, I, my understanding is that there is all, already a response by different countries, like Mariko was saying. Um, you know, they're supporting a lot of programming. I think the Irish are actually supporting a, a position in, South, in Sudan um, or South Sudan. And I think that there's going to be a position in Mali. So I think that there are definitely... Uh, position being lined up, I think it's just a matter of time and uh, and sort of pushing that. But also, the case, it also has to be a case of showing what we can deliver. And I think that you know, in answer to that question around the dearth of analysis and research uh, around the link between climate and security, I, I definitely feel that there's a lot out there, and a lot a lot of people are now you know realizing and seeing those links. But there's very little around what you actually do about it. And, and I guess it's a bit of a philosophical question because if you think about Climate security, then the sort of the result would be that the, the the climate is then secure, but you can't do that. So it really has to be a multi-pronged uh, approach from climate diplomacy. Countries have to reduce their their uh, carbon footprint. We all have to get to net zero. We have to focus on, you know, um, we have to focus on peace building. We really have to focus on that sort of um, uh, looking at protection of natural resources or or, or regreening and and looking at uh, environmental. Um, restoration, but we also have to look at that sort of like community level, we're building that resilience, working with that, and then at the same time, you have to build the systems within the governments to be able to return it. So it's really a sort of multi-faceted, we all have to do it together, and that's not an easy answer, because often you need, you know, money to be able to just do one specific thing, and actually this is a really complicated uh, multi-approach, uh, but it has to be done that way. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and we have a question from Alexandra Sianopoulos, who I'd, which I'd like to split into two. The first one, perhaps to Rob Bletcher, uh, uh, about um, a new category. Do we need a new category? We have the uh, less developed countries and island states um, in the past. Do you think that we should have a greater focus on fragile and conflict affected states where there is a great where there is a greater interplay between conflict drivers and the exacerbating effects of climate change? Is that is that a something that we need? Yes. No, um, in all seriousness, like the the um uh, I, you know, if that it, you know, that label having a clear label, um, you know, it makes it easier for people to think about things when there are clear labels. Um, and um, if everybody could could coalesce around some a label like that, you know, actually, I'm just sort of thinking out loud in um, um, in in uh, juxtaposition to something like climate security. Um, climate security sort of comes out of a history. I'm sorry, there's some. I'm in New York. Background noise is standard. Uh, the uh, there's a you know there's a history of of this term being used by national governments like the government of the United States to as as a um, as a term for something that threatens national security um, and climate security is seen as something that is needs to be confronted um, in order to maintain national interest national security. If there was a label that did not you know sort of have that freighted language, um, but um, freighted, you know, but but sort of dealt with the kind of conflict dimension more, um, you know, I think that would actually be a, a, a salubrious, um, a, a salubrious change. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. 
So perhaps a crisis group list of such states, uh, Rob Letcher, is going to be on your agenda for the new program. Um, and uh, another follow-on question on exactly that, uh, how would you call this type of conflict that has an environmental lens or impact? Is it an environmental conflict? What would you call it? When we look at conflict, uh, where we see conflicts that have been exacerbated by climatic, climatic factors. Is there a name for it? Uh, I'm not sure if that's really to me or not, but I think sort of maybe one of the questions here is the relationship between climate and environment. Um, and those aren't, those aren't quite the same thing, right? There can be lots of kinds of environmental damage that are not necessarily related to climate and you can, um, and, and you know, climate doesn't always, you know, capture the same thing that environmental does. So. I would say, you know, it's, you know, climate induced or climate exacerbated uh, conflicts or what, you're, or what you're talking about. Thank you. Um, and the second part of Alexander Yanopoulos' question, I will also like to put to Alan, if you're still with us. Um, Alan, there's a, he, he makes the point that, uh, that climate change factors are often dealt with separately from development factors. Do you think it's uh, needed and practical to join them up better? Can you think of that? Can you see ways of happen that happening in South Sudan? Is it practical? Or does everyone need to stay in their own lane? I mean, I think with the level of change that places like South Sudan are going to face and the level of challenge that they face from climate change, um, you know, they need all of the above. I mean, South Sudan is a place that desperately needs development. Um, it always needs humanitarian aid as well. Um, and politically, it's you know, it's, it's very unstable as well. So I think, I think, I think the real challenge we were going to have when it comes to addressing this, the, the, the climate, besides just the amount of resources that will be required, um, I think the development in some ways might be more straightforward. I think some of the mitigation measures, if the resources are there, will be more straightforward. I do think more challenging will be that, you know, the, 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 the political manifestations of it will, you know, will be channeled into politics. And I think it'll, it might be challenging as we find on many of these other uh, drivers of conflict, it might be challenging to find technical uh, uh, solutions when, when um, even if, even if they come from something like climate, I think uh, oftentimes the way to resolve them are going to be through, through uh, a politics, local politics or national politics. And, and I think, I think that in some ways, it's when we go from the technical to the political um, that, uh, that a lot of this is going to need to be, a, uh, get a lot more creative. Um, so I think in some ways the development is something we might know how to do. We just might really struggle, I think, and they have really struggled, for instance, in South Sudan to find ways to achieve development in a country that affect, you know, um, uh, really hasn't managed to, to form a, a stable polity yet. You know, so I think, I think the degree to which the clock, you know, uh, you know, that some of these, uh, really fragile states are sort of up against the clock, um, um, it, you know, I mean, that's something that's really going to come to the fore as we, as the uh, planet heats up. Thank you. Um, we have an external question from Elena Ruffato for Chris about uh, how specifically is Al Shabaab exploiting and benefiting from the illegal production and trade of charcoal, and can the EU and the international community do anything about it? Uh, Chris, do you want to answer that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so basically, historically, there has been a uh, an export of uh, charcoal to um, Gulf states, but other 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 countries as well that are using charcoal for smoking shisha. Um, and so, basically, what happened was the UN and the EU and different and the government put together a sanctions um, list and uh, put some controls in place. And actually managed to stop a lot of that export in charcoal and so that export in charcoal was actually quite a million dollar um, income generation steam stream for uh, militant groups including al-shabaab today um, because export has actually managed to drop quite considerably um, the manufacturer charcoal hasn't dropped a lot because of the rise in population and the need for 92 percent of somalis use charcoal as the daily energy needs. So the, the trade in charcoal still is quite large. We also uh, um, think, and there may be um, some uh, 
still some um, illicit uh, export, but we're still trying to look at whether that happens. But today, um, most of the revenue streams actually come from the transfer and the taxation. So uh, Al-Shabaab and Militant Groups will control certain areas. Um, then there will be um, movement of uh, natural resources between uh, the different areas, and then Al-Shabaab and Militant Groups will tax the movement of that of those char of those charcoal routes. So we know then that um, it's the taxation system is actually a big revenue stream for militant groups, and it's not just charcoal. We, we can also see it in sugar um, and also a lot of the transport of other natural uh, resources. So, and we also think that actually in the fishing and the legal fishing trade, there's actually more and more now in terms of. Um, uh, some of the taxation happening in that system as well. So, so we see that natural resources is actually quite a big part of the revenue generation, but it's also part of the control systems as well. So um, we can see examples of um, bombing, um, bombing water wells, poisoning water wells, uh, or they will break riverbanks or irrigation canals to try to control populations. So we see that the that natural resource and environment is actually a part of the, uh, the sort of control and financial systems um, for militant groups. Thanks, Chris. Um, Kylie, we have one other question uh, which I'd like to, to direct to you. Uh, you've done a lot of work on adaptation, and so you, uh, it's a question of time horizons. Um, which, uh, which climate hazards do you think are most likely to emerge in the short term and which are likely to take longer to fully unfold? Can you give us uh, a, a a kind of uh, timeline of how you expect these uh, risks to unfold? Well, first, I should uh, admit that we are in the midst of the climate crisis. It's not a future um, scenario. In fact, we're already seeing some of these natural hazards born or exacerbated by climate change coming to, to unfold. Um, and most of these are coming um, that are sudden onset. So we can see intensification and, and um, increasing frequency of things like cyclones. Um, once in a hundred year floods are becoming once in uh, five year floods, for instance. So we can already see these sudden onset events um, uh, coming to, to bear. Uh, some that are slowly unfolding or unfolding at a slower rate are things like glacial melt, sea level rise, slow onset events such as these. Um, and these happen over a period of time. And you know, it gives us an opportunity as an international community or different national governments who are experiencing these sorts of effects to intervene um, over time and to put into place different sorts of intervention. And that's why adaptation is so important, right? We can see these things unfolding slowly. Can we put into place things like um, more flood resistant or drought resistant crops? Can we uh, establish more efficient irrigation systems um, to, to deal with these sorts of creeping uh, uh, climate hazards. Uh, and so that's that would be sort of my take now is that we are in the midst of a crisis uh, and there are things we can plan for, the things that we have to react to. Thank you. And uh, one last question for Marika. We've, we, we've dealt uh, a lot with the, the risks and the conflicts arising from these climate, uh, climate stress. Is there no way that you see that uh, there is an, an upside to it, that somehow this is opening ways for people to cooperate more. People are seeing more reason to cooperate, that, uh, that there's, there are ways of weaving uh, these climactic issues into mediation processes and so forth. Is that something you're seeing any hope in? Yes, thank you for that question, um, because it's an element I'd really like to also stress that um, we shouldn't overlook how climate change, um, because it may be a common um, interests um, of, of, of people living in a certain conflict context uh, can also bring people together um, and um, provide an opportunity for um, actually a dialogue, uh, peace building um, and peace. Um, there we have some occurring examples, one in an urban environment in Nepal and one in a more also the, the pastoralist herder example in Darfur, where um, when designed in the right way, um, we, we have collect experience that that can actually be done. And to learn from those lessons, um, what we'd really like to be able to do is to um, ensure that all these wonderful climate data that we have, that they become much more widely accessible and that we can help um, get them into the right, hand, right hands of people who are around um, a negotiation table or maybe on different sides of a conflict. 
Um, so they have um, an equal understanding of not only what the challenges are, but also where the opportunities for coming to some, some kind of agreement might be. So in a way that would also be like, um, the right to access to climate information in a depoliticized manner and uh, a duty that it is uh, distributed appropriately to reap these opportunities. Thank you so much, Marika. That's a, that's a great note to end on, uh, an uplifting moment after nearly two hours of sticking with us. Thanks very much, everyone, for staying uh, with uh, all of us. And uh, you will be receiving a... Uh, a questionnaire from us. Um, please do fill it in after the after we've uh, we've uh, finished. Uh, we'll it'll come to you by email, and uh, so we can improve for next time. And uh, in the meantime, I think I will draw this to a close by saying goodbye from me and uh, Mariko, Rob, Chris, Alan, uh, Kaylee. Uh, thanks for a fantastic and really enlightening discussion. Thank you. Thank you.